Good morning. How are you guys doing? Welcome. Um, for those of you guys who are first time newcomers, we just want to welcome you. Um, on behalf of Faith Harvest, we want to say welcome. Uh, my name is Pastor Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at this church. Our lead pastor, Pastor Edmund, is currently on sabbatical. Um, one month, I believe, out of three have passed. Uh, I told him that it's going by painfully slow from my end, and it's probably going way too fast uh, for him. But nevertheless, uh, it has been a joy to be here more with you guys on this side. Uh, we tend, tend to be on the other side for, for youth group, um, as I am the youth group pastor. Um, so, but it's nice to be here. Um, it's nice to have um, time to, to speak and to share God's word on this side as well. And our youth joins us for these Sundays as well. Um, you know, I want to do something a little bit different. I don't think we've done this before, but um, as the, the first slide for the PowerPoint is up right now, um, this image just really captivated my heart and is a lot of the message for today, which is walking in Christ, walking in Christ. And so a little different, but if I can actually spend, just spend a moment meditating and just looking at this picture and what it means for you that Jesus is walking beside you. Or more importantly, what does it mean for you to be walking in Christ? Right. So think about this picture of walking. Um, our brother Julius gave us a you know, picture of his walk with the Lord. We talk about walking in that way as it pertains to our journey of faith, right? walking with God. But can we just spend a moment, just look at this picture. What does it mean for you to be walking in Christ? Um, I'm just going to let that just give it some time just to let it sit with you and just to meditate upon that. And then um, I'm going to read the verses for us. Okay, so you can just spend a moment, take a look at this picture. If you want to close your eyes, you can close your eyes. But what does walking in Christ look like and mean for you? Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumph triumphing over them in him pray for us. Father, thank you for your word this morning. And I pray that even a short moment with you, picturing what it means to have you beside us, to have you, as we were singing earlier today, to have you with us. And maybe many of us can think of this walk with you 
as hard, challenging, painful, unexpected. And yet I imagine many of us can also say this walk with you has been some of the most thrilling and joyous and peace-filled walking we've ever done and we've ever had in our lives. But God, as we meditate more upon what walking in Christ looks like, would you cover this time? Would your spirit be so present and alive and felt and known right now? Would you fill our minds with the truth? And God, in connecting our head and our hearts, I pray that the truth we know in our heads would catch fire in our hearts. So thank you, God, for this time. Cover me as I share. I'm merely a mouthpiece, but the power is your word, God. And so we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I want to share a, a quick or short video um, of walking as I was thinking about this topic and just reflecting upon it. <laughs> that was the first step that our daughter Eden took, a little over a year old, yeah. Um, shoot, why did I show this? I'm getting a little emotional, okay. Um, <sighs> um, all right, stop playing it, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, and I mean, how many more times can I use our daughters as a sermon illustration? All the time even without their consent. Um, but if you can just imagine, for a, for a parent, and if you are a parent, there are few greater joys than to see your child take his or her first steps. Learning to walk is a major accomplishment, right? Uh, this is a video, as I share with you, of Eden taking her first, our first daughter taking her first steps. You can see the joy and excitement on her face as well as the joyful just expression of her parents. Um, yes, I believe I was the one taking this video, and I did probably tear up too, just like seeing this moment, and it is a milestone for sure. But there's also this realization too as parents, right? Walking also introduces a whole new set of challenges and cautions. And this process of learning to walk, as you guys can imagine, falling is inevitable. And the ability to wander into harm's way, right? And so if you're a parent who's in the walking stage of a kid, you baby-proof your whole home, right? There's a lot of things that you never thought a child can get hurt from, but they get hurt from in the process of learning to walk. Our home right now is currently barricaded with boxes and play pens and anything that has um, a barrier so that our second daughter, who is learning to walk, does not get everywhere all over the place, right? And so our home looks pretty crazy right now, but there's a lot of fencing and different things happening right now. But let's take this analogy and think about it in terms of scripture. Scripture describes the Christian life in similar terms. Walking with God, or as today's sermon, walking in Christ is a metaphor for life with God, life with God. It's used throughout the Old Testament, right, about people on a pilgrimage or people on a journey through life according to God's ways. In the New Testament, as we read here, walking describes a life of faith. Walking describes a life of faith. It's learning how to walk all over again in some ways as we are born again. Because there's a certain way of life we may have been living in the past, but now we're living differently now. Our walk, we can say, looks different as a follower of Christ. And so it's important for us to get this familiarity of this metaphor that the Bible is trying to communicate to us. That walking spiritually requires strength. It requires stamina. It involves having a direction, a destination. And also we recognize, as we've been learning in Colossians, there's obstacles and there's pitfalls along the way, right? There's always the threat of false teaching, right? There's the threat of um, diminishing Christ, right? And a lot of challenges that come in this walk. And then there's also things that distract us along this walk and this journey as well. 
And so from this point of this letter in Colossians, from where we started, really the rest of this letter is Paul, Apostle Paul, unpacking what a life devoted to Christ looks like. And this passage prescribes the initial steps of the journey. How do we not only start off well in this walk, but how do we walk well to the finish as well? Okay? And so as much as Paul, he's thankful for this church and all the ways that they're walking, but they've strayed a bit, right? There's, a, there's something called the Colossian heresy. There's false teachings that are threatening um, believers to make Christ smaller in their lives. And Paul is trying to bring them back to say, hey, we've got to focus more on Christ, walking in Christ. Okay, so in light of that, there's three things I wanted to share with us about what this walk, what a faithful walk with Christ entails and what that looks like. Okay, first, it's a deepening intimacy with Christ. It's to denounce false teachings, and it's to define our identity in Christ. Deepening, denouncing, and defining. So let's start with the first one. We are to deepen our intimacy with Christ. Paul starts off by saying, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, right? We remember that the Christian life is not initiated by us. It's not about us saying, oh, I want God so much. I want. It's about him initiating the work of salvation. But what's amazing about the Christian life is that it's also sustained by Christ as well, sustained by God as well. And there's these different um, images that Paul gives us to describe what this is like. The first one, it says, so walk in him, in verse 7, rooted, rooted. Maybe that's a word that is often used a lot in church, right, rooted. It's this image of it's an agricultural image, right? If you guys are plant lovers or you grow trees or whatever in your backyard, you realize that the health of any plant or tree is determined by the roots, Right? And so if you were to ever look at a plant and it's withering or it's dying, the question that you would ask yourself is, well, how are the, how are the root systems doing underneath? Right? And so there's always the, the threat of what's underneath all of that. Right? And so this picture of rooted also would give us an, a picture of Psalm 1 about someone who is planted by streams of water who is always bearing fruit in the sense of when someone's union with God is close, they are like a tree that is always planted by streams of water, deep, healthy roots, and, and bearing much fruit and growing and abiding in him. You know, this is the irony of this idea of rootedness is that in the Christian life that believers walk best when they're unmoved and rooted in Christ. And so maybe we can say that, yes, deepening intimacy with Christ is a rooted walk. And so rootedness is this idea of being grounded, right, of being strong, and of being closely tied to Christ. And there's another image or a word that Paul uses. He says rooted and built up. Built up is a construction metaphor. It's this idea of a building of God, right, as a people of God, as his dwelling place, but also the church, the body of Christ, the community of people of God who are also referenced as living stones and being built into a spiritual house. And so this idea of being built and living stones is this idea that as the people of God, we're also being built up. We're also growing in this way as well. So there's an interesting uh, kind of a opposite, right? One of the ideas about intimacy with Christ is being grounded and then also one of growing or being built up. Paul also uses this word established in the faith. And I believe that's the effect of something that is grounded well and growing up. And then the last thing we talk about here, or Paul writes about here, is abounding in thanksgiving. Abounding in three thanksgiving. Um, I'm a grammar geek, so I like to look at some of the verb tenses here. And it's really important to recognize these things. When Paul uses the word rooted, built up, established, these are actually passive participles. So what Paul is saying is that, yes, we're supposed to do these things, but this is really the work that God is doing within his people. But there is one verb here that is active, that requires our full participation and concentration, which is what? Abounding in thanksgiving. 
right? While the other three verbs emphasize God's role in accomplishing this within us as we strive to walk in him, abounding with thanksgiving is an active participle that highlights our response to God's redemptive plan and the work that God is doing on our behalf. And so as we grow in Christ, as we focus on the gospel, as we seek to deepen our intimacy with him, it should produce more and more gratitude in our hearts. You know, one of the litmus tests of a Christian who you know is growing, who is rooted, who is being built up, is is there more gratitude and thankfulness in your heart? Just collectively, ultimately. That is something to examine all the time. That thanksgiving is a consistent theme that's found all throughout this letter and just even throughout the Bible, right? But that characterizes the life of a believer, right? And it's not just an attitude of gratitude either, but it's deliberate expressions of thanksgiving towards God and others. And that's something to ask God to search your heart. Are you more and more of a thankful person, a deeply thankful person before God, to God, but also to other people as well? In light of deepening intimacy with Christ, I also want to share this quote by George Mueller. Um, we, I think we referenced him quite a bit in our church. Uh, he was a Christian evangelist and a founder of an orphanage in England. And this is what he wrote here that I thought was worth sharing. He writes that, the primary business I must attend to every day is to fellowship with the Lord. The first concern is not how much I might serve the Lord, but how my inner man might be nourished. I may share the truth with the unconverted. I may try to encourage believers. I may relieve the distressed, or I may in other ways seek to behave as a child of God, yet not being happy in the Lord and not being nourished and strengthened in my inner man day by day may result in this work being done in a wrong spirit. You know, one of the things about intimacy that gets deepened in this understanding of God is sometimes we think that walking with God or walking in intimacy with God is about doing more things, serving more, coming to church, and all these things that we're supposed to do, do, do. And I'm not saying that's wrong. But first and foremost, a believer's desire and heart is to be with God. And so this was a question that I posed in a, actually it was a long time, I don't know, about a little while ago in a, in a creative short story I, I wrote with a creative team. We often ask this question, how are you doing? And sometimes I want to flip that and ask people, how are you being? How are you being with the Lord? And sometimes, to be honest, guys, that proves to be harder. Just to sit, just to be, without the felt need to have to do something to prove your worth or to accomplish something or to make yourself feel better, but that God doesn't need any of our efforts or labors. He can accomplish what he wants without all of that. But the fact that he invites us to that and the fact that what he longs for is not just us doing more stuff for him, but to learn how to be with him and enjoy him for all of eternity starting now, that is the goal of deepening intimacy. That is the goal of deepening intimacy. So how are you being with God? And quite simply, how are you at being still? Just being and enjoying physically too. I read a great quote, um, this was by Matt Perman. It just came up on my Facebook feed. I know I still have Facebook, but um, he writes this. He says, the only way to be productive is to realize that you don't actually have to be productive. Our goal is to please God, not appease God. You really want to live a life that is productive and counts and bears much fruit from the kingdom of God is to first understand that God is already pleased with you in Christ and learning to be and enjoying him is the chief end of man more than trying to do more things to please and garner his attention and his affection for you. Do you understand that? As our brother Steve was sharing, do you understand that's the kind of love that God has for his people? 
And we'll get more into that, but that is also the heart, the gospel as well. Next. We are to deepen our intimacy with Christ, but we're also called to denounce false teachings. As we know, the Colossians were besieged and assaulted with false teachings about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. There was deceptive and destructive heresies that were spreading throughout this land and in the church. And so we want to be reminded of these things. We want to be reminded that false teaching deceives and denies Christ. Right? Paul writes here in verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. That poses the fact that there is an imminent threat and danger upon the life of God's people. That this phrase, even that no one takes you captive, speaks about this influential and very delusional nature right, of the doctrine of the world and of man to enslave and for us to, to take our attention and focus away from Christ. And so this description of false teaching reminds us of its devious nature and how very subtle it can be as well. And ultimately, the foundational flaw of all false teaching is what? It's distorting, it's denying, and it's diminishing who Christ is and what he's done. And we have to recognize and we have to remember that faith in Christ must be who, about who he is, truly. He is God, fully God, fully man, and that he, what he accomplished on the cross is fully sufficient right, for, the, for the forgiveness and redemption of mankind. You know, I know we had a VBS this past weekend, and for those of you guys who are part of that, uh, thank you again for all of your hard work, efforts to that. And I was reflecting on the theme again, you know, Breaker Rock Beach. And I remember when I was talking to Director Kevin about prayerfully considering what the theme for this year's VBS was going to be, I really appreciated how it had such a strong bent towards apologetics. And what I mean by that is defense or an answer for the Christian faith. And that the premise was this, that the world says this, but God says this. And so I really appreciate just the heart behind this theme and what was covered, but just think about some of the false teachings the world has versus what God's people know. Right? So here it says on, on one of the days, it says some people say that truth can be different for different people. Truth can be different for different people. But God says that truth comes from God. Is there a relative truth? That's what the world believes. Your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. Or is there an absolute truth? And that comes from God. That was one of the topics. Another one. Some people say, do what makes you happy. Do what makes you happy. Do whatever feels good. But God says, God's plan is best. Do you do whatever you want to do, or do you trust that what God says is best for your life and to obey and follow him? Some people say, and this is what's interesting, even in the church, that some people still believe this, that being a good person gets you to heaven. Being a morally good person, doing good things, is how you gain entrance to heaven and to be with God. But God says what? The Bible says everyone sins and needs a savior. Some people say that there are many ways to get to heaven, that all different religions all lead to God. But God says, Jesus is the only way to heaven. And lastly, some people say, well, if you don't agree with me, then you don't love me. God says to speak the truth in love. You know, it's amazing. I'm so thankful that even truths like these that are still hard and wrestling with are being shared with our youngest generation, the young kids, and how important it is for us to hold fast to truth. Hold fast to truth. And so I was just reminded, like, yes, this is why we chose this theme. This is what we want to instill, right? That the world says this, and this is the world and the message that you will hear over and over and over again versus what we believe the truth to be of who God says, who he says he is, and what he has accomplished. 
And so false teaching deceives and denies Christ, but faithful teaching edifies and exalts Christ. Right. And so Paul, Paul writes here, in the, here that there's the, for in him, in verse 9, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Do you see these words, fullness of deity and bodily? That speaks to what? Both God, Christ, right? His full divinity being fully God, but he dwells bodily, meaning what? He came in the flesh, right? He assumed and took on a physical body, not the appearance of a, a physical body, but an actual physical body so that he can really die, right? And, and, and be the, the, the savior of our sins. If he only appeared to be a human being, right, then it makes what he did on the cross not real. Right? Oh, he kind of died, but not really. But he took on a full human flesh where people can see him, talk to him, touch him, all of those things. But his body, right, was broken for us. He died for us. And when Paul talks about this idea of fullness, he's talking about he is fully God and fully man. There's no room for any false teachings. This is the true Jesus Christ that we believe and know. And so Paul is reminding his, um, God's people that faithful teaching is about elevating and exalting Christ. This is something I would like for you to consider and think about. There's no neutral in the Christian life. There's no neutral in the spiritual life. Either you're growing closer to God or you're drifting further away from him. And maybe you're unaware of that right now. But every day there is an assault, right? There is an enemy who wants nothing but to destroy you. And the question is, is are you going to stand on God's rock-solid truth or are you going to believe the father of lies and Satan? And so there is no neutral in this. We need to understand that we need to continue to hold to faithful, true teachings about Jesus Christ so that we can grow closer to him. And anything... Anything in our lives that would make Jesus seem less important, small, diminished, or unattractive, we need to fight against. We need to fight against. We need to denounce those false teachings. And that anything that makes and exalts and lifts up the name of Jesus, I hope and I pray that that is a deeper longing in our hearts. That he satisfies us. He fills us. And I don't know about you, but when you hear just good, gospel, faithful preaching that lifts up the name of Jesus, I hope that lifts up your heart as well. That's what it does for me when I listen to other preachers and pastors as well. When you hear the gospel being faithfully preached, that's what it's supposed to stir in us. That's what we want. That's what we long for. So we're to deepen our intimacy with Christ we are to denounce false teachings, and lastly, we are supposed to define our identity in Christ. This observation actually came uh, about a little bit before I was supposed to, our service started today. But one thing that God was reminding and showing me in these verses again today was the fact that look at all of these verses that start from verse 11 all the way to 15, right? All of the things of what Jesus Christ has done for us. I don't know if you noticed that there's a disproportionate amount about what God is asking his people to do in response to him versus what's already been done. And so let's define our identity in Christ. Look at everything that Christ has done already for us. First, he circumcised our hearts. That's in verse 11. It says, in him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What is he talking about here? What is he talking about? Well, in the Old Testament, circumcision was a painful and a physical way that God's people would distinguish themselves from every other type of people in the world. And now Paul is taking this idea of circumcision and connecting it with baptism. Right? And you see this phrase here, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. And so what circumcision was for the Old Testament believers, baptism is, is for the New Testament. And what is baptism a symbol of? 
a union that brings us to Christ, that binds us with Christ. And what it symbolizes is the old self, the old nature and flesh dies, is buried. And then what? The new self in Christ is raised, is raised. And that celebrates Christ's resurrection. And that the power of God that raised Christ from the dead now lives in the people of God. And so we know and we believe that Jesus has conquered sin and Satan and death and that we are also raised with him in newness of life. Jesus, we also read that Jesus conquered over death. That's found in verses 12 and 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. You know, through Jesus' um, death on the cross, through his bodily resurrection, if Jesus didn't raise from the dead, right, if he didn't ascend, then he wouldn't have conquered death. But what did he do? He rose. He ascended. He resurrected. And that this is a thing that's already happened, that being made alive in him reminds us of what? this assurance of hope that because Jesus was resurrected and he was raised from the dead, so those who also place their hope and trust and faith in him will also be raised one day. Still to this day, one of the things that people are afraid of the most is death. And anything that even poses a threat or imminent danger to death scares the living, you know, out of people but not for the people of God. We believe that death is merely only the beginning of eternity with God in heaven. And why Apostle Paul would write in the book of Philippians that to live is Christ and to die is gain. As long as I'm here, I'm going to keep spreading the gospel and sharing the good news. If I die, that's gain for me too because I get to be with Christ forever. That is the hope and life of the believer in Christ. That because Jesus conquered sin, Satan, and death, that we also will be raised again to newness of life, and that death does not have the last and final say. What else? He canceled our debt. Jesus canceled our debt. Verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This is more of a idea of forgiveness and a more of a forensic component of this idea of God cleansing us of our sin healing us, cleansing us, forgiving us. And there's also a financial connotation to this. Um, I think for all of you guys, you would know and probably have heard that you don't want to be in debt, right? You don't want to as much as possible, um, minus maybe some long-term investments. But generally, by and large, right, people would advise you not to be in debt, right? Why? Because it's a money that you owe, right? So whether it's I don't know, big purchases or the small things, um, as well as things that have big interest rates like credit card debt, things like that. Generally, you don't want that. The Bible takes this idea of debt in the sense of morally. Morally, we are all bankrupt, meaning there's nothing good that we can do to earn our way to God. There's nothing that we can do. We're all morally and spiritually bankrupt. That's why Jesus had to come and cleanse that record of debt. But here's the part that I think is still challenging for us today. We believe that, I believe to an extent. But sometimes I wonder if there's still uh, uh, a part within us that thinks or acts or lives like we still have to repay that debt. But remind yourself, this is a debt that you could never, ever, ever pay back to God. The work that Christ has done is fully sufficient. And if you live your life thinking that, oh, man, I was a, I'm a debtor spiritually. I couldn't do this, but I'm going to still keep trying. You can never repay God for this debt. And it's a futile effort. And so remind yourself that Jesus has canceled this debt. This record is clean forever of sins of past, of present, and future. Jesus also condemned the enemy. Look at verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open 
shame. I, I was curious about this word disarmed and what it was meaning more. And it's this idea of stripping off, right? So you think about these powerful evil forces and principalities and authorities and Jesus just taking all of their power and armor and and weapons and all of that and completely stripping it off and completely removing it off of them and saying I'm in charge and to remind us that Jesus disarmed and he defeated all of the spiritual forces of evil and that Jesus has secured his redemption and victory. And that leads us to my last point. He confirmed our victory. It says, by triumphing over them in him. Jesus is victorious. He always has and he always will be. Every day you wake up, I want you to look at this list And remind yourself that nothing about this list changes in your changing circumstances. I want you to wake up every day and look at everything that is right with you. Even if it feels like everything in your life is going wrong. I want you to wake up every day and look at this list and recognize that God, in his grace, in his kindness, in his love, did this for you. And for me. And how disproportionate Paul's even focus about all this is like, yeah, he talks about walking and being rooted and being built up. But you know what? It's really about first understanding what God has done for you in Christ. How even in practical matters, Paul spends more time reminding God's people about everything that Christ has done. And from then in which you respond and live life in gratefulness, in humility, in trust and dependence on him. So let me ask you a question. Are you walking in Christ? Are you walking in Christ? Is there a deepening intimacy with him? Not just doing more stuff for God, but really learning how to be with him. Is there a readiness to denounce anything that poses even the smallest threat of making Jesus smaller or less important or less exalted in your life. Denounce those things. Fight against those things. And are you defining more and more your identity in Christ? Do you recognize that all of this is what's right about us now because of Christ? That this is who we truly are. That we are a people who are truly free that we are a people who live in the resurrection reality, that we are a people who are truly forgiven of anything you've done wrong, past, present, and future. Any sinful thought, word, or deed has been forgiven and covered. That Jesus has disarmed all of the spiritual forces of evil in this day, and he is reigning and ruling, and nothing is too hard or surprises God, even in the state of the world that is in today. And he confirms our victory. Uh, we did a short Bible study in Revelation a little while back, but the, the, the theme or the tagline is, is God wins. God wins. He's won the battle. He's won the war. In spite of anything we may face, no matter how many shortcomings or fallings or sins we may have, he's won. He's victorious. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what walking in Christ truly looks like. And that so much of it is holding on to you, Jesus, and the foundational truths that make up Christianity. God, I'm reminded of a time I had a poster in the youth group room. And it said, religion says do, but Jesus says done. I'm reminded that Jesus, you have done everything for us to live and to walk in you to start off well but also to finish well in this whole journey of faith that even in all the verbs that we're called to being rooted being built up being established that all of that is still the power of your spirit working within us not for us to conjure up and work in our own strength or efforts 
So thank you that you're a God who initiates a beautiful gift of salvation, but you also sustain us in our sanctification, and you lead us to our ultimate glorification. I pray for your people right now, pray for all of us, that we would have a deepening intimacy with you, a closeness, a union that is so deep and personal and close and intimate more than the things that we know we ought to do, that we respond with abounding with thanksgiving joy in walking with and serving and following you. For us to denounce false teachings, that if it doesn't bring us closer to you, Jesus, we're willing to surrender that and cast it out because what we want ultimately is more of you and for Jesus, you to be our treasure. And lastly, God, may we as your people, define our identity in Christ. This world has always had an identity crisis. Who am I? Why am I, why am I here? Who said so? But the Bible tells us very clearly who the people of God are. And so I also pray, God, for those who don't know you in this way, would you open their hearts? Would they receive this good news and this message that there is salvation available? that we are sinners in need of saving, and that, Jesus, you are the only way. And for those who are in Christ, would you help, God, define these truths and identities more rooted, more fully in Christ, that nothing about these truths change. Every day we wake up, we live in this resurrection reality and these truths. So we thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.